All right, guys, welcome to Flav Oriana's MMA show. I'm your host, Flav Oriana, brought to you by Four Corner Sports New York. All right, guys, uh, this past Saturday, we had a uh, UFC Fight Island number five, main evented by Corey Sanhagen versus uh, Magic Marlon Moraes. The bout was at, at the Bantam weight, um, 135 bout. And it was, uh, I gotta say, we uh bantamweight looks pretty good at at this very point. We probably had the most likely the knockout of the year, maybe knockout best knockout ever in the UFC. Uh, that was a fight between Joaquin Buckley versus uh, Ampa Kansanganive, if, if I'm saying his name correctly. And and yeah, so we have we have to talk about that. There's also Conor McGregor news. You know what's gonna happen is when is he gonna fight Dustin Poirier? Is he gonna fight him this year? Are the UFC not gonna budge and they're gonna force him to fight in January? And obviously the the ongoing feud with Israel Adesanya versus John Jones. But without further ado, let's go on to the UFC fight island, fight island number five. All right, so this past uh, Saturday it just happened the uh, main event. Corey Sanhagen versus uh, Magic Marlon Moraes. It's a lot at stake right at this very point because if Marlon Moraes was to win, chances are since he's already the, the rank num- he's he, since he's already ranked number one um, across all the world in bantamweights, he would most likely get the shot um, to face Peter Yan, which. Ideally, it's it would really suck only because of the fact that Aljamain Sterling should be in line after his his impressive uh, some uh, guillotine chokehold or I think it was a rear naked chokehold on Corey Sandhagen back at UFC two fifty uh, one and uh, Corey Sandhagen he's trying to redeem his loss got his he experienced his second loss you know. By uh, Aljamain Sterling, and he's trying to redeem himself, getting closer and closer towards a, a title shot. So both these uh, fighters had fought. Round one, I felt like Corey Sanhagen. Uh, he's five eleven. He's around my height. My, um, Marlon Moraes is five six. I felt like Corey Sanhagen's height and his distance on how he was able to close in and keep uh, Marlon away from him, but still be able to uh, hit him with, with a lot of damage. I think that was one of the biggest differences in round one. And Marlon Moraes, yeah, he was able to tag uh, Corey Sanhagen. I mean, Corey Sanhagen is as, is as white as a milk. You know, you saw, I believe, his, his whole left eye. Well, not not left eye, his, his whole, like, the majority of the left uh, part of his face was all red. Because he got clipped up being... One, I want to say twice, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe three times, but I'm going to go with twice. But um, Corey Sanhagen definitely took round one. Was able to make sure he was able to control the fight. Was able to attack the body, attack the legs. And going into round two, Corey Sanhagen got a better understanding, a better feeling for uh, Marlon Marais. Ended up throwing a, a high uh, jumping knee to the face. Was able to still fight at distance, and then out of nowhere, I mean, I didn't, I, I should have seen it coming. Timed it beautifully. Was able to, was able to hit Marlon Moraes only where Marlon Moraes was not going to be able to attack him. Did a spinning wheel kick, caught on at the top of his dome, right on the, on the left temple of his head. It just clipped him. Uh, Marlon Morris did like a backflip, uh, did like a rolling backflip, you know, after that, after getting hit. And then uh, Corey Sanhagen ended up capitalizing, you know, doing ground and pound. And then after that, Mark, Goddard, Mark Goddard ended up stopping the fight. People complain on Twitter that Mark Goddard ended up stopping the fight too early. I think it was a perfect stoppage. There was no, there, there was no disagreement with Marlon Rice. Uh, I mean, it was a perfect stoppage at that point. Corey Sanhagen now gets a, gets a huge victory over the number one um, ranked bantamweight in the world. So now there's a little bit of confusion on which direction, who should face Peter Yan. 
because uh, Aljamain certainly been, has been wanting to, you know, to face Peter Yan. He feels like he's, you know, very deserving for it. And I believe Corey Sanhagen in his post-fight interview ended up making it a lot easier. He said that Sterling is next and that the only people that Corey Sanhagen wants to fight is either Frankie Edgar or TJ Dillashaw. Those are the two people that are above him at this point. Mind you, Frankie Edgar had a very, very impressive performance against Pedro Munoz. And TJ Dillashaw has been suspended for two years. Has been on suspension for has been on suspension for the last two years and should be coming off a of suspension like around January 20th, if I'm not mistaken, around that time frame. But who should I feel like uh, Corey, Corey Sanhagen should fight? I want to say TJ Dillashaw. Why? Even though Frankie Edgar is a former champion, so is TJ Dillashaw. But I think there's a lot more hype. There's a lot more to bring to the table. Sure, it would not be a, a fight night or, or any of that magnitude. Most likely, it's going to be a pay-per-view because T.G. Dillashaw is a household name. And, you know, it's something to sell. You know, are they going to most likely put T.G. Dillashaw on a January pay-per-view card? Most likely, yes. And that means that Corey Sanhagen might have to fight T.G. Dillashaw then. The UFC is not going to want to wait around. I'm, I'm pretty sure T.G. Dillashaw by now is already, you know... In, in fighting mode, he's in fighting shape. He's probably he's he's probably ripped out of his mind as usual. Hopefully, he he learned his lesson by now by not taking steroids. But that should be the fight to make. I think, in my opinion, like I said it before, Frankie Edgar should definitely fight Dominic Cruz. You know, those two legends colliding, two both former champions. I think that'll be a great matchup stylistically, with with the way that uh, Dominic Cruz you know does like his bopping style. And he, the way he punches and Frankie Edgar's pressure, I think that should be a great matchup. That's something they, that the USC should definitely put forward. And they should put forward with uh, Corey Sanhagen versus TJ Dillashaw. Something that has been noted in somebody, and, one, and that one of the um, U, former USC fighters had said that Corey Sanhagen falls into the category of Leon Edwards. And the reason why I say that and the reason why he has said that is because the fact that Leon Edwards, nobody really knows him, Corey Sanhagen... It's just starting to get known by now, even though he's high up in the rankings. They both need that big time victory over a, a, a household name. I think that Leon Edwards should fight somebody like uh, a Nick Diaz. Uh, not Nick Diaz, I'm sorry, a Nate Diaz. That would definitely elevate his stock. I mean, Jorge Masvidal is too out of his range at this point because his popularity has grown through the roof ever since that flying knee to Van Askren. So, getting back to Corey Sanhagen, I think Corey Sanhagen should fight a TJ Dillashaw. Household name, you know, Bantam, a former bantamweight champion. He, at one point, was trying to go for being a double champ by uh, dropping down to flyweight. And, yeah, I think that should be an excellent matchup between uh, Sanhagen versus Dillashaw. That should be the fight to be made. And we'll see. And definitely... Uh, Peter Yan should face Aljamain Sterling. But we'll get to that in, in a little bit. Going now into what might be possible knockout of the year. It should definitely be knockout of the year. Wow. So if anybody has seen Joaquin Buckley fight, he his last fight was his first uh, fight between uh, his, his USC debut between Kevin Holland. More than a couple weeks ago. I want to say less than a month. And I didn't know so much about um, Kevin Holland. I'm not Kevin Holland. So I didn't know so much about uh, Joaquin Buckley. Kevin Holland was um, ended up fighting that day because prior, uh, I think it was like two weeks prior to that that fight, uh, Trevin Giles ended up passing out due to the anxiety right before the, his match with Kevin Holland. So the UFC said, "Okay, we're we're gonna make we're gonna end up giving you a fight. Stay ready." Kevin Holland st- stood ready. Uh, UFC ended up bringing in Joaquin Buckley. He's made his UFC debut. And wow, when I saw Buckley versus Holland, I was amazed. I mean, Buckley came out, you know, like a bull at that point, knocking down shots. He was throwing so many, you know, overhand shots. He was going ballistic. I felt like he was exerting too much energy, too much power. And Kevin Holland, being the veteran that he is, 
he kept on using the, his own power against uh, Buckley. So, resulted to a Kevin Holland win due, due by knockout. Now, fast forward weeks later, now you're having uh, Joaquin Buckley uh, going into the octagon for the second time in, I want to say, about like three or four weeks against a Dana White uh, USC contender star, uh, Aimpa, uh I can't, it's very hard to pronounce his name. I know I said it earlier. Kasanganaev, if I'm not mistaken. Aimpa Kasanganaev. He had a performance too um, a few weeks prior. Making his uh, second fight in the octagon. Aimpa, 8 0. Buckley, you know, just had a loss to Kevin Holland. No shame in there. So they're both fighting. I'm thinking, all right, this should be an excellent matchup. Aimpa could take down, should, should be able to take down Buckley down with his wrestling. Buckley is probably going to go, you know, buck wild, you know, no pun intended. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Buckley ended up going for a, a, a high left, uh, a high um, roundhouse kick. You know, I'm a counter. The whole first round was bananas, you know, back and forth trading shots. Buckley was, was like, a, uh, like a madman in that first round. I gave the first round to Buckley. Aimpa just was settling, was trying to get a better understanding on how Buckley is, but that pressure that Buckley ended up bringing ended up uh, hurting uh, Aimpa. So Aimpa was wasn't able to get his uh, a better understanding on how um, Buckley's movement is, the way he changes levels, with his head movement, his footwork, and everything like that. That's very very important when you're in the octagon. So Aimpa, I felt like he didn't get that um, understanding because of his because of uh, Buckley's pressure, which is bad because. Moving on forward, people are going to realize that, hey, I doesn't know how to handle pressure very well when people attack him. But anyways, um, Buckley sh- ended up shooting for um, he ended up shooting for a high leg kick. That ended up getting caught in the second round. So catching, the, catching uh, Buckley's leg at that point, catching his foot, I don't know why I put sit still. And Buckley felt like, all right, you know, if he has my foot, I'm going to just use the other. I'm going to jump up, pop, and then kick him in the face. So Buckley ends up having, he had more than enough time to stand still, generate his power, jump up, and do another spinning back kick. And this time he caught flush right in between the nose. And if you could watch that that clip on YouTube, you'll see exactly how it, uh, what I mean. I'm going to look like as if this guy was dead at that point. You look like you look like one one of the Walking Dead. He got hit right in between the nose, and boom, it was over. I mean, this man had his eyes roll like the Undertaker. This guy had like a little bit of snot coming down. He he looked as stiff as a zombie at that point. And he, as soon as he f- fell back, or he saw his head, you know, bounce off the canvas, it was a little bit scary. But I was but when I ended up seeing seeing it live in person, I was like, oh my god. That has to be one of the greatest knockouts that I've ever seen in my life. And surely, in my opinion, it is the greatest knockout that I've ever, I, have, I have ever seen. I'm sorry, I've been getting way too excited at this point. But Joaquin Buckley made a, made a name for himself at that point. He deserved, at that point, all the performances of the night bonuses. He deserved at least $200,000 in bonuses for that knockout. It was sick. It was insane. I honestly had to watch that fight a good... A good three to four more times because I was just astonished on how um, what's his name uh, Joaquin Buckley's uh, spinning back kick that was one of the craziest shots I've ever seen in my life and I feel bad for Aimpa because he's going to have to live seeing that clip for the rest of his life that's unfortunately the the loss that ended up stopping his um, unbeaten streak but it is what it is I mean you got to move on forward so now the UFC has new, looks like they, they could generate a new um, popularity for an up-and-coming fighter in Joaquin Buckley. He already drew some fans in his first fight against Kevin Holland. This just elevated his stock. I mean, this is kind of similar to what ha- ended up happening to um, Jorge Masvidal. Jorge Masvidal didn't, except did it on a pay-per-view, but more eyes being atten- um, grabbed to the audience. And especially this was on International Fight Week, so it even elevated more of his popularity. So... I'm very, very excited to see what's going to happen with Joaquin Buckley. This is very, very um, good to hear that, you know, 
a lot of people ended up reacting to this thing. I mean, this went on Sports Center. This was all over every um, sports media outlet. I mean, this was amazing. I'm very happy to see. I, now, I don't know who Joaquin Buckley's going to end up fighting, but whoever he ends up fighting, you know, I, I guarantee you this, a lot more audience are going to be uh, going to be wanting to watch what this guy is going to be uh, putting out there because this guy, he puts on a show, and uh, we want to see that more. I mean, it's going to build uh, more fans in, into uh, this great sport in MMA. All right, moving on forward. <sighs> Um, Conor McGregor news. Now, Conor McGregor ended up uh, tweeting out saying that he accepts the fight with Dustin Poirier, but he wants to fight in 2020. Does not want to wait for that January card. The reason why this is very, very important is because the UFC does not like to put a Conor McGregor f- uh, fight, uh, put, put Conor McGregor on a card when there's champions um, on it. Reason being, when, uh, when there's a champion on a card, especially on a pay-per-view card, it gets accumulated by points. And however many buys the UFC does, they have to now pay these champions, right? And obviously the, the person that the champion is fighting, you know, points, you know, more money on however more buys it is. Obviously when Conor, Conor McGregor ends up fighting, he usually does way over a million buys. He probably does about anywhere between 1.5 to 1.7, you know, it wouldn't be shocked if maybe like two two million buys at this point, because uh, how how big his aura is, especially that this might be a, this is gonna be a rematch between Dustin Poirier, and yeah, no, this is uh this is big news because uh, who do you put you know, are you if you're the UFC do you give in? Because I personally don't give in. You know, it's kind of, it's like a damn if you do, damn if you don't type of moment. You're not gonna wanna move the. Ba- the what's it called the flyaway title fight and Valentina Shashenko's uh, title fight, you know, m- move both those title fights, you know, into the, the December card. Why? Because now that it just seems like you're favoring Connor, you could possibly put them in, on that December card, but the UFC does not want to do that because they don't want to be paying more money to these these championship fighters, which is a, a, which is a darn shame just because of the fact that. These fighters should be getting a lot, a lot of money to begin with, due to the fact that they're playing, uh, they're they're fighting a very violent sport. You know, people get knocked out, people get submitted. There's injuries along with it. I'm not saying these these fighters should get like any type, any type of like NBA contracts or anything like that, but just maybe like an, an extra five percent more than what they're making. But if I'm the UFC, I am putting Conor McGregor on that December card. Why? December usually is, in my opinion, one, one of the bigger cards. Because it's always July and then December. Dana White usually like, likes to close out the year with a nice pay-per-view card. Last year, he put three title fights with Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington. Uh, uh, Max Holloway versus Alexander Volkanovsky. And Amanda Nunes versus Jer- uh, Jermaine Durandamy. This year, as of right now, it's only Amanda Nunes versus uh, Megan Anderson. I put Conor McGregor at, as the main event, and then I try to fill out the rest of the card at that point. Uh, for the July, card, I mean for the November card, it's not the most anticipated card. It's saying it nicely, I mean yes, you have Davidson Figueroa versus Alex Perez. They definitely got to put something in there. I mean, or you could put Conor McGregor in that card too, and it just elevates that card tremendously. But that's a that's a problem because of the fact that the UFC does not want to pay extra for the champions you know because obviously the pay-per-view buys and the points that come along with it so in my in my opinion they got to fix something out they, they definitely got to fix it fix that, that uh november card because that november card as of right now as we speak it's not something that's very appealing towards the very ca- the casual fan i'm sure like the hardcore fans are going to buy it no matter what but that card has got to get fixed I mean, if I had to throw a suggestion right out there, you know, for that November card, put put Zabi in Yair, put uh, Max Holloway versus uh, Calvin Cater, and put Conor McGregor on uh, that main event card. And for the December card, put uh, Stipe versus Francis Ngannou. That would be the, the best perfect matchup, you know, for a main event. And then put Tony Ferguson 
versus if nothing ever if nothing happens to um what's his name um the guy that ended up coming from Bellator Michael Chandler if nothing ever come and if uh Justin Gaethje and Khabib Nurmagomedov end up fighting in two weeks as, as scheduled like planned if nothing happens to uh, Michael Chandler then put Michael Chandler on that December card versus Tony Ferguson simple done you know that I'm right I I did uh Sean Shelby's McMainers and, and Dana White's job right there for you do that you you, you you know, you're going to have tons of fans that are going to be very happy and outstanding with, with that type of results. And and we as the fans, we want to see um, a good card. November, December is, is going to come. We already know what's going to be for October. And let's do it, UFC. But uh, without further ado, you know, that's going to cover everything for uh, this uh, this week's uh, MMA um, show. I'm your host, Lava Rihanna. Please stay tuned. I'm going to cover more um, in the in the later days. This week, we're going to have uh, Brian Ortega versus Korean Zombie. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, animosity between those two. And I'll probably throw in an episode by Thursday. All right. All right, guys. You guys have a good night. And I'll talk to you guys soon. All right. See you guys. Peace.